In this PowerPoint, we'll review the different types of chemical formulas associated with molecular and ionic compounds. Molecular substances, whether they're compounds or elements, can be represented by several types of formulas. The first and most common is the molecular formula, which just shows the type of each element using the element symbols and the number of atoms of that element using subscripts following the symbols. This is the molecular formula for methane gas, which contains one carbon and four hydrogens in each molecule. How those carbons and hydrogens are bound together is represented in a structural formula. So structural formulas represent shared electrons as lines or dashes. And what we can see here for methane is that the carbon is the center and those four hydrogens are bound separ separately to it in four different covalent bonds. The ball and stick model of the molecule shows the three-dimensional geometry. Those four bonds off the carbon are not actually flat or 90 degrees from each other as implied by that structural formula. Instead, they extend into three dimensions around the central carbon atom. And finally, the space filling model. The spheres represent the space occupied by the atom, including its electrons. The spheres overlap because in covalent bonds, the outer orbitals of the atoms overlap in order to share electrons. Molecular substances can form isomers. These are substances that have the same number and type of atoms, but different arrangements of those atoms in the molecules. Another way of saying this is that they have the same molecular formula, but different structural formulas. Acetic acid and methyl formate are examples of two isomers. They both contain two atoms of carbon, four of hydrogen, and two of oxygen in their molecules but the way those atoms are bound together is different. In acetic acid, one of those oxygen atoms is bound between a carbon and a hydrogen. In methyl formate, that oxygen atom is found between two carbon atoms. It's a subtle difference, but it can have a big impact on the properties of the substances. For example, acetic acid is the active ingredient in vinegar. Methyl formate, on the other hand, is an industrial chemical that's used in the manufacture of styrofoam and as an insecticide. Now let's look at ionic compound formulas. This is a space filling model for sodium chloride crystal. And this is the correct chemical formula for sodium chloride. There's an important difference here compared to molecular substance formulas. As the space filling model shows, sodium and chlorine ions don't exist in individual pairs in our ionic substances. They're part of a large crystal lattice. But the formula we use to represent that lattice shows only the smallest representative unit of that crystal. This is what's known as an empirical formula. It's the simplest whole number ratio of the number and type of atoms or ions in the compound. It's not necessarily the actual number present. In any crystal of sodium chloride, there can be a huge number of individual sodium and chloride ions. What makes it sodium chloride though, is that those ions are always present in a one-to-one -one ratio. The lowest whole number ratios in ionic compound formulas can be predicted based on the charges of the ions that are bound together. This is because each formula unit of an ionic crystal is considered electrically neutral. In other words, the total positive charges of the cations present must equal the total negative charges of the anions. The formulas always follow the same format. The symbol for the cation is written first, followed by the anion. Subscripts on the formula for each ion indicate the lowest whole number ratio between them. And we can qu quickly determine these ratios using something called the crossover or crisscross method. The first two steps in the crisscross method are to write the symbol and charge for the cation and anion present in the ionic compound. And remember that we can predict these charges for the representative elements based on their position on the periodic table. Say I wanted to write the formula for the ionic compound that formed between calcium and chlorine. 
I know from the periodic table that calcium is an alkaline earth metal in column two, and that means it always forms cations with a plus two charge. Chlorine is a halogen from column 17 and always forms anions with a negative one charge. In the final formula, the total positive charges must balance out the total negative charges. And you might be able to see that in order for this to happen, I'm gonna need two negatively charged chlorines to balance out that plus two charge on the calcium. This indicates a final formula of CaCl2. I can also get this formula though by crisscrossing the charge numbers. What this means is that the two on the calcium is gonna become my subscript on the chlorine. There's an assumed one on the chlorine charge and that's fine because it turns out that subscripts um, of one are always assumed two. We don't actually write that number. So to write my final formula, I simply bring these two symbols together using the charge numbers as the actual subscripts, and I leave off the pluses and minuses. And this is because it's an electrically neutral unit overall in the final formula. So this becomes then CaCl2. There are two additional steps. First of all, you should always double check that the subscripts really are in their lowest whole number ratio. If they aren't, you just need to reduce them to that ratio. So for calcium chloride, it's a one to two ratio. We can't reduce that anymore. So we're actually fine. We don't have to deal with step number five. Step number six though, is to check that the total charge of the cations equals the total charge on the anions. We have one calcium ion, which has a plus two charge and two chloride ions, each with a negative one charge. So that's plus two and minus two, they balance each other out. Let's do another example. This time, we'll do the formula for the ionic compound between aluminum and oxygen. And from the periodic table, we know that aluminum forms ions with a plus three charge and oxygen with a minus two charge. I crisscross those charge numbers. So that means that the three on the aluminum is going to become my subscript on the oxygen and the two on the oxygen will become the subscript on the aluminum. And then I write the final formula, bringing that together, crisscrossing the charge numbers and leaving off the pluses and minuses. So that becomes Al2O3. Two and three actually is the lowest whole number ratio for that combination. We can't reduce it anymore, but we can double check that our charges balance out. So if we have two aluminums, each with a plus three charge, that gives us a total positive charge of plus six. Three oxygens, each with a minus two charge, gives us a total negative charge of minus six. Plus six and minus six balance each other out. And this is the correct ionic formula for aluminum oxide. Let's look at one final example. This time we're going to combine magnesium and oxygen. Magnesium is another alkaline earth metal from column two. So we have another ion with a plus two charge and oxygen of course is a minus two charge. We crisscross the charge numbers here so we end up with a two subscript on both the magnesium and oxygen. So when we write this final formula, we bring it together and leave off those pluses and minuses, we end up with Mg2O2. And hopefully you can see that this is not the lowest whole number ratio we could have. You can actually reduce a two to two ratio to one to one. And that's what you should do for the final ionic compound formula. It's always the lowest whole number ratio. So the final formula is Mg. Oh, so just remember ionic compound formulas are always empirical. And the one thing that you really need to look out for in using the crisscross method is that sometimes you will not get the lowest whole number ratio when you crisscross those charges. So you just have to make sure that you reduce 
So in the past example, we were just using elemental ions, but ions can also come in the form of charged molecules called polyatomic ions. These are molecules that in the formation of their covalent bonds actually gained or rarely lost an electron. As a result, they developed a net charge and they can take part in ionic bonding as a discrete unit. So here are some common polyatomic ions that you'll find in ionic compounds. And notice that most of these are made up of nonmetals. The subscripts in the formulas you have to consider fixed. They are not going to change when these substances form ionic bonds. Instead, the polyatomic acts as a unit, just like an elemental ion would. It's just a little bit larger. For example, this is the space filling model of the crystal lattice formed for the ionic compound calcium carbonate. The carbonate anion is a polyatomic. It's a molecule of one carbon and three oxygens that gained two electrons during formation, so it has a net negative two charge. And that negative two charge allows it to form an ionic bond with the positively charged calcium ion. Now notice that each carbonate ion in this lattice is exactly the same with one carbon and three oxygen atoms in the exact same arrangement. We can use the crisscross method for writing formulas with polyatomics in almost exactly the same fashion as we did with the elemental ions. So let's write the formula for the ionic compound that forms between calcium and the polyatomic phosphate ion. Calcium is a plus two charge from its position on the periodic table. And I look up on my list of polyatomic ions phosphate to discover that it has the formula PO4 with a negative three charge. So there is a reference sheet available on Blackboard for you to download for ions, and it has a list of common polyatomics that you can use, refer to, to get your polyatomic formulas and their charges. So I'm still going to crisscross my charges. The numbers are going to become the subscripts on the opposite ions. So calcium is going to have a subscript of 3, and phosphate is going to have to have a subscript of 2. Now, in order to indicate that that entire phosphate unit comes in two, a ratio of two, what I have to do is actually put the phosphate formula in parentheses. So I end up with Ca3 and then parentheses amount around my PO4 and the two outside of it. Notice that, again, those subscripts that came with the polyatomic stay on the polyatomic. They're fixed. The subscript 2 is the crisscrossed one from the opposite ion charge. And we also, of course, leave off the charges on the final formula, the pluses and the minuses, simply because it's an electrically neutral unit. So 2 to 3 is the lowest whole number ratio. And when we look at the total positive and negative charges, I have three calciums, each with a plus 2. That's plus 6 total for the positive side. I have two phosphates, each with a minus 3. That's a total of negative 6 on the negative side, and it balances out. Let's look at one more example, this time between aluminum and hydroxide. Aluminum, I know from my representative charges, is always plus three. Hydroxide, I look up on my list of polyatomic, and it's a formula of OH with a negative one charge. My charge numbers will become the subscripts on the opposite ions. So OH is going to have three of those units, and we've got an implied subscript of one on the aluminum from the implied charge of one on hydroxide. So in writing the final formula, because I have more than one hydroxide unit in this formula, I put that hydroxide formula in parentheses. It becomes Al parentheses OH and parentheses 3. And the 3 outside the parentheses indicates that I have 3 of both oxygen and hydrogen. It's the unit OH that 
is actually acting as the ion, and it's the unit OH that I need three of to balance out my plus three on my aluminum. One to three is the lowest whole number ratio, and that plus three on the aluminum is balanced out by three negative ones from my hydroxide ion. In summary, molecular substances, both compounds and elements, are commonly represented by molecular formulas and structural formulas. Ionic compounds are represented by empirical formulas showing the lowest whole number ratio of ions in an electrically neutral unit of the compound. And ionic compound formulas can be predicted from ion charges.